have come this way. And we pray that you that the Lord's blessing will be upon you as we open his word together. Amen. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we call upon you and your spirit now. Please come. Come close to our hearts. Speak to our minds. Help us to better understand the truth of your word. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> How many of you like blackberries? Oh, I thought everybody would raise their hand. But, uh, okay, we mentioned uh, blueberries. You have blueberries, but uh, and I like blueberries, but blackberries, I love blackberries. I remember as a child going to pick blackberries wherever we could find bushes of them growing around the neighborhood. Uh, perhaps some of you have the same, same memories. In the summer of 1989, I arrived at Southern College, now Southern Adventist University. My plan was to work all summer long to save a down payment for my first semester's tuition that would come up in August. Praise the Lord, he had a job waiting for me in the very first place I put an application in, and that was at the grounds department on campus there at the college. But I would need more money than that little part-time job would afford me. And so I made up my mind that no matter where I had to go, what I had to do, I was going to search out every possible additional job to earn the income. Because I had made a, a pledge to the Lord that uh, months prior that I I didn't want to go and get involved with indebtedness. Indebtedness had hurt my life in many ways prior to this time, and I, uh, I decided that uh, I was going to make that pledge to him and not get into in, uh, in debt anymore. There was a lady named Mary Morford at student housing there on campus, and she had learned about my situation and found me some living quarters, uh, not in the regular dorm, but uh, because of my age and, and marital situation, she, uh, they had some old single student apartments up in the back part of the campus behind McKee Library. They hadn't torn those down yet. They had made plans to build new uh, additional uh, rooms and <coughs> for the students there. In the middle of that summer, she and her husband had planned for a, a long three-week vacation. And so to help me out a little bit more, she invited, she uh, offered a job for me to house sit for, for them while they were gone. And uh, I accepted and uh, she told me then, she says, now, you don't worry about having to buy any groceries or anything. She said, we'll have the pantry full and the refrigerator and the freezer full and uh, there'll be just about anything in there you, you would like to eat. And she said, we also have a garden. It's a small garden, but uh, it's a well-producing garden in the backyard. And she said, you're welcome to eat any of that you want. And she said, by the way, we'll have so much there if you want to invite some of your friends, fellow students over to eat meals with you, feel free to do so. We want you to treat our home just like it is your own home. I just couldn't get over that kind of hospitality. I've had people be uh, give me uh, opportunities to to uh, accept their hospitality many times, but nothing to this extent. Plus, they were going to pay me for being there all that time. So, one of my favorite items from their garden was blackberries. They they had these uh, thorn this thornless variety. Uh, they grew in these long, tall stalks, 
and this is no exaggeration now, no fishing story, but those blackberries, that variety was almost three quarters the length of my thumb and just as big around as my thumb. And I could hardly wait for them to ripen. In fact, every few days I'd go out there to check and see if any of them had ripened and I began to grow impatient. I was so anxious to dig into those, what I knew were gonna be juicy, sweet blackberries, but uh, it wasn't but just a few more days until they did start to ripen. I found a, a, a good way to use those blackberries as well. You see, they had left me a half gallon of vanilla ice cream in the freezer. So uh, I used those blackberries to top off bowls of that ice cream, and it was great. As is the case with most things we grow, waiting for the first fruits of, of anything to come to ripen where we can partake of them is something that... Uh, brings about anticipation and it also tends to lighten up our taste buds. We can't wait to, to dig into those fresh fruits and vegetables. This time of the year most people's attention is directed to the spring holidays. Some call it Easter, some call it Passover, and some spring break. But today I want us to turn our attention to one important part of both of those religious holidays. We don't hear about it very much, but I hope before today is out, you'll understand its importance. It's called the wave chief of the first fruits. The wave chief of the first fruits. But first, let's start by looking at the connection between Passover and Easter. Now, this past Wednesday was the Jewish Passover. Tomorrow, one billion plus Christians around the world will celebrate Easter Sunday. The Christian celebration being a result of the Jewish feast day. And a summary of the Passover ritual emphasizes the central truths of the Christian faith. So let's quickly run through those. The Passover is symbolic of the death of Jesus. As the Passover lamb died, so Jesus died on that Passover Friday, about 3 p.m., the time of the evening sacrifice on that 14th day of Abib. What day of the month was it? 14. 14th. The Passover of the sacrificial lamb delivered ancient Israel from the destroying angel, you recall, while they were uh, prisoners, while they were slaves. And God told Moses to have each family of uh, pick out a lamb without blemish and then slaughter that lamb, take its blood and paint it on the doorpost, the lintel, so that when the destroying angel came through Egypt that night, those who were in that house covered by the blood on the door, they would be saved. The blood of Christ now reconciles all who come to him in faith. Amen. All right, the Passover promoted fellowship and consecration among the Lord's people. Turn with me to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Notice. I'm sorry, that's a, that's a mistake. We'll hold, we'll hold off on that. Uh, it, is, it is the same now for the Lord's Supper and Communion. That is, that the 
the Passover um, brings about a desire to fellowship more with each other, to participate in the uh, Passover and its meal associated with it is a way for people to fellowship and consecrate themselves to the Lord. It was a communal meal typifying deliverance from Israel's captivity of 400 years. Deliverance that called for consecration to God. All sin had to be put away. Nothing less than complete holiness to the Lord, as described in Psalm 29, verse 2, would be accepted. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which started the day after Passover, was about that very issue of putting away sin. This is why on communion Sabbaths, the attendance is low. Most of the time, there are two reasons. There are others, but most of the time, there are two reasons why the attendance is low on communion Sabbath. First of all, the lack of humility, causing some to not desire to participate in the ordinance of humility, which is the foot washing service or the presence of sin in their lives that is still not dealt with. And they understand that the scripture forbids Christians to partake of that communion service, the emblems, when there is sin present in their lives. Turn with me to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. I promise you this one will be the right text. Luke chapter 23, verses 53 through 56. Fifty-three through fifty-six. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock, talking about the body of Jesus, where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. When they returned and prepared spices, fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Let's go to the next verse. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and other certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And what happened there at that tomb after Mary and the ladies found that it was empty. Most of them ran off, but Jesus caught Mary outside of the tomb and spoke with her, didn't he? Yes. yes. And he gave her a message to give to his disciples about meeting him later in Galilee. But something that he also told her was that he's going to heaven. He's going to see her father and his, fa and his father, her God and his God. And most of the time, uh, we don't think about that. I don't hear it mentioned that often when, when people deal with the, this particular text. But he leaves Mary at that point. Before going to Galilee, he goes to heaven. And there he is presented before the Lord symbolically as this wave chief that's being waved before the Lord. Early on the 16th day, <clears throat> excuse me, the Passover is also symbolic of this resurrection as typified in the wave sheaf. And early on the 16th day, remember Passover was what day? 14. 14. 
Sabbath, the next day was the 15th, and then Sunday morning was the 16th day. And as Leviticus 23, 11 instructs, it says, on the morrow after the Sabbath, which was Sunday, the first day of the week, after Jesus died, our Lord rose from the grave. Amen? Amen. If he didn't rise from the grave, then our faith is in vain, isn't it? Is that right? Just as the priest in the temple that same morning was to wave the sheaf before the Lord, so when Jesus arrives that morning in the heavenly throne room, he is symbolically waved before God the Father, who accepts his, sac his sacrifice as being sufficient. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15 with me. 1 Corinthians 15. We want to look at verses 20 through 23. 20 through 23. But now Christ is risen from the dead, Paul writes, and has become what? the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. The first fruits of the final harvest of the righteous began with Jesus going to heaven and appearing before the Father. He was raised from the dead, and his raising from the dead guarantees that you and I, if we sleep in Jesus, will be raised as well. Amen. That's good news, isn't it? So what did this waving of a sheaf before the Lord mean? Well, what is a sheaf? Anybody know what a sheaf is? Yes. Yeah. It's a bunch of wheat. Yeah, it's a, bu it's a bundle of grain. And it is a quantity of the stalks and ears of any kind of cereal gr uh, grasses and other plant material that's bound together before being cut for harvest. You've seen pictures of them, I know. In ancient Israel, it was usually barley and wheat. But what was the process used in bringing the sheaves to be waved before the Lord? On the 14th day, the Passover, Three men were selected, and they were to go to the fields and cut some of the first ripened barley. Barley became ripened for the harvest at that time of the year. And of course, that uh, harvest would not be finished for another 50 days or so when Pentecost came or shortly after. None of that new harvest could be used or consumed until the wave sheaf, that bundle, and its offerings were presented to the Lord in recognition and thanksgiving for the provision of the new harvest. On that 16th day of Abib, the same day of Christ's resurrection, what Christians call Easter Sunday, the priest would wave the sheaf of grain in front of the Lord at the altar there at the temple. Thus, that was called the waving of the sheaf. 
the waved sheaf of the first fruits, along with its associated offerings, were presented to the Lord at this time because this is the time when the barley ripened each year. And it would not end, like I said, until Pentecost. Now, the offerings that were, were given were a male lamb with, without blemish. And then, of course, there was mixed a cereal mixed with oil and a drink offering. Those offerings were made after the, the sheep was weighed. So, if Passover, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and the wave sheaf of the first fruits are our biblical connection. What is Easter all about? Where did it come from? I found two short articles online that I wanted to share with you that explains this very well. Let's start with Easter, the name of the, of the tradition, the holiday. The name Easter is never associated with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in the original scriptures and is actually derived from the word Eoster. That's E-O-S-T-R-E. Eoster was Queen Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, Noah's evil but enterprising great-grandson. We find that in Genesis 10, verses 6 through 8. Nimrod built the major cities of Babel, Asher, Nineveh, and Cala. Genesis 10, verses 12 through, uh, verses 10 through 12. These cities were known for their evil and unimaginable practices and perversions. Remember the story of Jonah? He was sent to Nineveh because that was one of these cities that was very, very wicked. <laughs> Queen Semiramis kept these evil practices alive by deifying her husband Nimrod after he died as the sun god. She gave birth to an illegitimate son and then named him Tammuz. We were just looking at some of the uh, months in the Jewish calendar during prayer meeting the other day, and Tammuz is one of the names that, I, uh, that the Hebrew people brought back from Babylon to use as a name for one of their months. And this was after they spent 70 years in captivity in Babylon for not being true to God. And yet when they came back, they used a number of these uh, false gods' names for the names of their months. The horrible human sacrifice, idolatry, astrology, and satanic worship in these false religions some for the sun god and some for the moon god or goddess, continued until the time of the Tower of Babel. Because of their sin, God confused the people's language to disperse them around the world. Genesis 11, 7. As the people resettled in new lands, they took their pagan worship with them. We've heard of that before, haven't we? Queen Semiramis came to be known as Ostera, an Anglo-Saxon goddess who symbolized the rebirth of the day and new life in the spring. She also became known as the goddess Astarte. Esther, Ashtaroth, and Ashtereth the wife of Baal and the queen of heaven. Nimrod's other names were Baal, Balaam, Molech, 
the God of fire, and the great life giver. Any serious study of the Old Testament reveals God's hatred for these, this false worship. And Ezekiel 8 verse 14 specifically mentions Tammuz in its condemnation. Now, in another article there, a scholar, Bruce Forbes, makes these comments. Bede wrote that the month in which English Christians were celebrating the resurrection of Jesus had been called Eostermoth in Old English, referring to an Anglo-Saxon goddess named Eoster. And even though Christians had begun affirming the Christian meaning of the celebration, they continued to use the name of the goddess to designate this false season. Bede, he says, was so influential for later Christians that the name stuck, and hence Easter remains the name by which the English, Germans, and Americans today refer to the festival of the resurrection. Now, before closing, let me add one additional and crucial bit of information. In Leviticus, it uses that phrase, the morrow after the Sabbath. That came to be known as what people call today Easter Sunday. The morrow after the Sabbath that Jesus was crucified and rested in the tomb. That is not about, I'm talking about this holiday, is not about changing the Lord's seventh-day Sabbath at all. In the time of Jesus, he was put to death on Passover Friday. What day? The 14th. The next day, the 15th, he rested on the weekly Sabbath that had been ever since the beginning of time. He rested in the tomb. That day started, that Sabbath started the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. The first and the last days of that feast were always ceremonial Sabbaths. Nowhere in Scripture can you find a command of God, His prophets, or His apostles to change the seventh-day Sabbath, the true eternal day of rest and, the, and worship, the real Lord's Day from Saturday to Sunday. Reading the Scripture carefully, you can't even find an inference or example of the Sabbath being changed to Sunday because an erroneous attempt was not made to do so by the Catholic Church until A.D. 336, some 300 years later, after Jesus died and returned to heaven. And yet this church continues to brag about having the authority to make the change while Protestant churches continue to follow her so-called authority. When the Roman Emperor Constantine became a Christian, making Christianity legal throughout the empire, the method of choice for evangelizing the church from the pagan populace was deception. Taking the artwork, the statues, and the various points of life, stories from the pagan gods, the papacy simply renamed these false gods with names from Bible characters and membership in the Roman church skyrocketed. After using that tactic for a while, the papacy outlawed the existence of any other church by using various forms of persecution 
including the death of 50 millions plus and the vast number of Christianity has been following the papal beast power of Revelation 13, 14, 15, and 17 ever since, thinking they were following the one true God, his word, his prophets, and his apostles. All of this I just shared with you is the biblical and historical truth about this season that is called Easter. Really, it's about the first fruits of the true church of God. It is about Jesus being the first fruits of all who God will raise from the dead and take to heaven along with the righteous living at Christ's second coming. That's what this season is about. Jesus was raised from the dead and became the first fruits of all that will follow him in the second coming, in the resurrection at the second coming. Amen. This is what we need to focus on. Not on Easter eggs and bunnies and all this other stuff. That's all, every bit of it comes from the pagan customs of yesteryear. I appeal to your thinking and sincere desire to follow God's truth today. Leave Easter behind, totally. And like all of the other pagan holidays and things that have been incorporated into Christianity, I appeal to you to follow God's word. Amen. Amen. Only his word. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay for our sins. If there are any here today who have not made that decision, I pray that the Holy Spirit will impress upon them just now to make that decision. Accept Him as their Lord and Savior. Have their names written in the book of life. And Father, we thank you that He was willing to go much further to the death of the cross and then was raised to be the first fruits, the first fruits of all who will go to heaven when he comes back. We thank you for all of your truth and for your word, and we thank you and praise you that you don't force any of us to accept the truth, but you ask us to do so because we love you and honor you. This is our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's conclude our service with uh, him five to six because he lives and I will invite you to stand up and finish our service.
Thank you for this time again together, Lord, and we're asking that uh, you bless us with safety as we make it to our homes and our next destinations. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your love and mercy. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.